All right, all right. Red Nation, today we're going to be talking about quantum noise in your x-ray imaging. Why do you have quantum noise? Why do we even call it quantum noise? Coming up here at How Radiology Works. If you remember, we have our x-ray tube, and then we have our image receptor somewhere down here. And imagine I'm just drawing one pixel or one detector element, one Dell in our detector. And you can see all of these I'm drawing are individual x-rays. In reality, we'll typically have, you know, on the order of a million x-rays that'll be coming through and entering the patient. I should draw the patient as well. Here's our patient. And, you know, we have our x-rays coming through. We call this the incoming x-rays. We call this the remnant x-rays. As the x-rays actually pass through the patient, if you remember, I've drawn many that are actually making it all the way through. Some x-rays will actually just stop inside of the patient. This is, they're stopping due to photoelectric effect. Some x-rays will be coming into here and then they will scatter inside. Primarily what we're making an image of here is the difference between those x-rays that pass all the way through and the x-rays that stop. We call that the attenuation. And what we're doing here is we're actually just in the best case on new detector systems, what we can do is we can actually count these individual photons that are making it to our detector. We'll count, we'll say one, two, three, four, five, six. And we can also know what energy each of them has. The other way of doing it on traditional systems is we actually get the total amount of energy which comes in and in the time that we're actually taking that acquisition, we get a measurement of the total energy that's deposited here in our detector. We can use that in order to determine the attenuation coefficients. In CT, we can actually make a map of those coefficients. In X-ray, we're just actually looking at kind of like a shadow gram of the coefficients for all the materials along this path length. Let's take a step back and think of an even simpler model where I have my X-ray tube a little ways away. The rays are basically coming in very close to parallel here. Then I have just a small object. It has a known thickness. We have an incident intensity. We have an output intensity. And then we have our detector here. And we want to measure our output intensity. If we know what this value is here, if we know what the energy of our X-rays are, that's going to determine the attenuation coefficient in our material. And then we have our thickness here. For this very simple problem, we can actually see that we could calculate what the intensity is that we expect to see at the output. Let's use this little I with the little brackets around it to mean the expectation of our intensity. This is what we expect the intensity to be. And on average, that's also what we're going to get. But if we actually make measurements of our intensity on our detector, sometimes we're not actually going to measure the exact value. We're actually sometimes going to measure data that's a little bit higher on the intensity. Sometimes we'll measure a little bit lower on the intensity. If we look at measurements that we make of on the detector of our intensity, what we actually get is something that looks like this. It's actually a curve. We call this a normal distribution. As long as the amount of x-rays is relatively large, as long as we're talking about more than 30 x-rays, we're actually talking about something that's a normal distribution for the intensity value, which we expect to measure on the detector. Width here of the Gaussian, it actually goes like one divided by the square root of the number of x-rays that we're going to be measuring. As you have more x-rays, width is actually going to get narrow. You're going to have less variation or less noise. If you had fewer x-rays, this width of our distribution is going to get wider. You're going to have more noise in your image. 
noise in your image just goes like one divided by the number of x-rays that you have measured at your image receptor. And in order to get x-rays measured at your image receptor, you actually have to put them through the body, right? You have to put the x-rays in the x-ray beam through the body. Some of those x-rays are going to stop in the patient. The x-rays that stop in the patient, those are going to actually help to generate the contrast. And then some of the x-rays are going to pass all the way through. And we want to make a map, essentially, of the difference between those x-rays that pass through and the x-rays that stop, like we drew at the beginning. Actually, when we end up passing more x-rays through, we end up getting a higher radiation dose. We also end up getting more confidence, less variation or less fluctuation in our measurements when we pass more x-rays through. When we measure a higher number of x-rays that actually contribute to our measurement, that measurement is less noisy. This is a fundamental limitation of x-ray imaging in that the noise is actually proportional to one divided by the square root of the radiation dose. As you use more dose, your image does get less noisy. Here's just an example. If you look at this little bitmoji of me, and then you start adding noise, you can see that as you add noise, the ability to visualize structures is diminished. Up here, you can see like a little bit of detail inside of my hair. You can't see that at all down here. There is a trade-off, and we want to understand this trade-off well between the noise in the x-ray image and why do we call it quantum noise? We call it quantum noise because our x-rays come in what's called quanta. It just means it's a counting event. One x-ray photon is one quanta, and thus we call it quantum noise when we have a noise which varies based on how many x-rays that we end up counting. We have videos about the technical parameters that can affect this radiation dose, namely the KV, the MA, the time as well, the MAS. And basically the idea that we want to try and accomplish this Goldilocks scenario where we get a just right x-ray acquisition, because if our dose is too high for the clinical task, what we do is we end up making an image which is too clean. If our dose is too low, we end up not being able to actually perform the clinical task. We want to be in that intermediate area where we can perform the clinical task, but we don't want extra irradiation dose such that it goes above and beyond the dose which would be needed in order to perform that clinical task. And in order to do reliably on our x-ray imaging, the concept of an exposure index has been introduced. An exposure index is basically talking about the exposure that we measure on our detector and trying to repeatedly get the same exposure on your detector such that you can get the same level of noise in your images. Check out our video next on the exposure index and deviation index. You can really understand the details there coming up next.